In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And through it all, and through it all, they were in the temple, blessing God. So far the text. Please be seated. Yes, I said, and through it all. Even though your translation says, and they were continually in the temple blessing God, the Greek can be translated in the New Revised Harrison translation, <laughs> and through everything, through it all, they were blessing God. So I'm Matt Harrison. I'm the president of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. And uh, that is a group of over two million Christians around the United States with tens of millions other, of other Christians connected with us around the globe and a number that is increasing around the globe daily, much as we are challenged domestically. So, Pastor O'Donnell, there was an anniversary and a retirement. A woman had spent 40 years in the headquarters of the Missouri Synod recently. We were celebrating her retirement, and she came up to me and she said, Pastor Harrison, I know your successor is not going to be as good as you. And I said, well, thank you very much. No, she said, you don't understand. Your successor will not be as good as you. Oh, thank you very much. I... Oh, what do you mean by that? She said, well, look, I've been here for 40 years. I've seen every Missouri Senate for four, president for 40 years, and each one is worse than the last. <laughs> <laughs> now, nobody will ever say that to you, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. That's right. <laughs> Please turn his microphone off. <laughs> and nobody remembers anniversary sermons either. I'm going to tell you what you already know. And the Word of God is what you already know, and it's going to work on you and continue to work on you through your entire lives. Diapontos, through everything, through it all, they continued blessing God. 150 years, my goodness, I did the math, and I never studied the hard sciences, but that takes us back to 1865. Wow. Through the death of a president, economic decline in the 70s, Indian uprising in the next state over, another economic decline in the 90s, depression, the death of a president by a terrorist in 1901, McKinley, a world war, 14 to 17, where all of our churches and your ancestors were speaking German and they were ridiculed for it, told they shouldn't be doing it, and they were uh, harassed and their churches had yellow paint sprayed on them. Their pastors were sometimes tarred and feathered. Then again, depression in the 20s and another world war because my father, they knew my father had a German mother, indeed his church, and he was ridiculed in World War II for having German ancestry. Then through the world war and economic boom and the baby boomers and the huge number of churches that grew from that and the large increase in the number of American Christians and the Missouri Synod. And then Korea. And then Vietnam. And then the sexual revolution, the apex of which we've had the sexual revolution now for going on 60 years. The apex now is the state calling good what the Bible calls evil, and the Bible calling evil what the state calls good. And here you are today, 150 years later. Wow. What blessings. What amazing blessings. Dia Pantos. Through it all. Now, the message that has brought you together and kept you together, and by, by the way, I know you've had internal controversies in the church, several separations. Uh, and several other churches that resulted from it. 
But through it all, the Lord has kept you together with a message. From the very beginning, in the book of Acts, the message was very simple. You crucified the Lord of glory. But God raised him from the dead, just as he promised in the scriptures. Therefore, repent, believe the gospel, and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins. That message is as true today and as relevant for you today as it was 2,000 years ago when it was first preached. And you know why it's relevant? Because it's the message Jesus said he wanted preached about himself. And why is it still relevant? Because you are exactly like the first people it was preached to. A bunch of sinners. Through and through. So, what does Jesus say in the text? And he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. It may not be impressive to you, but it is the truth of the Bible. There was a promise in Genesis 3 about the coming seed of the woman who would crush Satan's head. His heel would be bruised, but he would crush Satan's head. That was the promise of Jesus, the Scriptures tell us. And you know that hundreds of years before Jesus, the prophets like Isaiah were prophesying that this Jesus would suffer and die, be wounded for our transgressions, pierced for our iniquities. Hundreds of years before the fact, Read Psalm 22. Read Isaiah 53. They depict hundreds of years before, yea, 700 and 1,000 years before Christ, they depict the life of Jesus. And exactly what happens in the New Testament. It's miraculous. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. He's walking along with these Emmaus disciples. They've just witnessed the crucifixion in Jerusalem. They saw the whole thing before their eyes. And they've just told him, yeah, we thought this Jesus was the one to redeem Israel. But they killed him. That is the most ironic statement in the whole Bible. We thought he was the one to redeem Israel, but they crucified him. Guess what? How does Jesus redeem Israel? Precisely by being crucified. That is the act. It's done. The big stuff about Christianity is not what goes on inside of you now. It's not how your stomach feels about faith one day in or uh, day in and day out. It's not about you deciding for Jesus. It's not about you living a holy life. It's not about anything you do. The big stuff already happened 8,000 miles away 2,000 years ago on a cross, and there all of your sins were put to death. He was put to death for your transgressions and raised for your justification. And you do have transgressions. You need only look at the law. We should fear and love and trust in God above all things. But what do you fear? You fear being ridiculed by your friends. You fear speaking up for Jesus. You fear praying in a restaurant for Pete's sake. You fear your health. You fear that somebody's not going to like your views. You fear not having enough money. You fear for your health. You fear all kinds of nonsense. Don't you realize that your Father in heaven loves you and he's counted every single hair on your head? That's what Jesus says. And he knows every time a hair falls from your head, that's how much he cares for you. Look at the birds of the air. Don't you see them? Look at the lilies of the field. They're so beautiful. They're here today and they're gone tomorrow, thrown into the fire. See how the Lord clothes these beautiful things. These are worth nothing by comparison to you. Won't he take care of you? Oh, what wretched sinners we are. No need to go through the whole list of the Ten Commandments. Be honest. And you know what? If you aren't a sinner, then you have no Jesus. 
150th anniversary or not, the Lord's Supper is coming up, and if you aren't a sinner, then please leave now because Jesus is not for you. This Lord's Supper is not for you. Christ came to save sinners of whom I am chief. And if St. Paul, the greatest Christian on earth, speaks that way, you can be sure you can speak that way too. It's true, isn't it? Christ dwells only in sinners. That's the good news. You're exactly who you're supposed to be. People who need Jesus. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures, and he said to them, This is written, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning with Jerusalem. Christ suffered. Forgiveness is to be preached in his name. Repentance and forgiveness. Let me tell you, your sins are paid for. Let me tell you, everything you ever did, everything wrong you ever thought, everything wrong you even think about doing, everything you will do, your secret sins, your horrible sins, your thoughts, that if people knew your thoughts, you would be embarrassed forever and never able to confront them again. All those things have been paid for with the blood of Jesus. They're drowned. They're like a drop, literally a drop in the ocean. Seriously, a drop in the ocean. They are gone because of Christ. This Christ is prophesied because of you. This Christ uh, is conceived in the Virgin Mary's womb because of you, because of your sinful conception. This Christ is born for you. This Christ grows as a child. He's circumcised for you. He follows the law completely because you can't and nobody can. He follows the law completely for you. He's the perfect child for you. He's perfectly obedient to his parents for you. He's knowledgeable about all the scriptures. He teaches in the synagogue when he's a kid for Pete's sake for you. You have a hard time picking up the Bible and opening it. He knows it for you. This Jesus comes and is baptized for you. He doesn't need baptism, but he's baptized for you. He sticks himself in the water so that when you go in the water, you pull Jesus out with you. That's what Luther says. This Jesus is cast into the wilderness to be tempted for you. You fail in all temptations in thought, word, and deed. He never fails. He's tested by the devil exactly for you. Be gone, Satan, he says, for you. He goes about preaching the good news, the forgiveness of sins for you. He goes about healing people for you, the blind, the lame, the lepers. Come to him. When people come to you for need, you ask, oh, I can't part with $5, can I? Oh, this is so difficult. I can't decide whether I want to give away $2 or not, or can I help? I can't get involved with this person, can I? Is it safe? Yet Jesus cares for every single person who comes to him for you. This Jesus speaks words of consolation for you. Every time you're in difficulty, you remember, come to me, all you are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to me. It's for you. This Jesus goes to Holy Week for you. He rides in and has the accolades, the wrongly put accolades by a crowd misunderstood. Standing him, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He does it for you. He clears out the temple for you because you can't worship a right and you worship money and other stupid things. You worship sex, you worship people. You want this boat, you want that house, you want this lake place. He clears the temple for you. This Jesus speaks Words of consolation for his disciples, for you. He says, after I'm gone, another one will come. He washes his disciples' feet for you to show you that Christianity is not about what you do. Every other religion in the world thinks Christianity or religion is about me serving God and doing something for God. Christianity is not that. It's Jesus serving you. I came not, he says, I came not to be served, but to serve and give my life as a ransom 
for many. He speaks His words of institution for you. Take ye, this is my body, this is my blood for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We will do that today. And He is here today with His body and blood for you sinners. He is betrayed with a kiss for you. He's, got, he's taken into captivity for you. He shuffled between Pontius Pilate and Herod for you. He's set up in front of the people and ridiculed for you. Pilate gives an option. Barabbas or this guy? Barabbas! Give us Barabbas! Crucify him! Crucify him! Crucify him! He stands there for you. He bears His own cross for you. He's nailed to the cross for you. Each one of your sins nailed to Him. Nailed in His hands and His feet for you. The thorn of crowns is on His head for you. He speaks from the cross for you. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. How many times in an argument at home or in business, or in the community, or worse of all, in the church, you have said, I will never forgive that person, and I will bear a grudge forever. You do. Jesus nevertheless says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do, and they're crucifying him. He does it for you. He says, into thy hands I commend my spirit. It is finished. For you, it's finished. It's done. It's taken care of. Jesus dies for your sins because God loves you. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. He goes to a grave for you. How many of you have watched loved ones go to the grave? I talked to a pastor recently who served in Michigan. He's been in the same parish for 18 years. He's done 213 funerals. One pastor has done 213 funerals in the last 18 years. Jesus went to a grave, and so will we, barring his return. But don't you get it? He's gone there. And what did he do? He rose again on the third day for you. All you face in the future is a resurrection. An eternity. I love the way your kids sang the Nicene Creed, especially coming to a crescendo when they talked about, when they spoke and sang of the resurrection at the end. Did you get that? That's what we face. Because Jesus dies for us. And Jesus said, preach this stuff. He told them, you are witnesses of these things. And you may have trouble believing the Bible, but if you actually read it, you'll recognize the fact that the Bible is true. That the ones who write the Gospels actually saw it happen. And that these documents will stand up against any scrutiny better than any other documents of the ancient world. They were witnesses of his resurrection. And then he said, Behold, I'm sending the Holy Spirit. And this message which is preached is the message of, of the Holy Ghost. And even as I preach it to you today and proclaim you forgiven for the sake of Jesus, the message happens now. For faith cometh by hearing, and hearing comes by the word of God. Yes, you say, I'm having trouble believing this. We all have trouble believing it. You come to the sacrament, I have trouble believing this is the body and blood. We all have trouble believing it. Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. Jesus comes for you. Then he led them out as far as Bethany. Why did he go to Bethany? Isn't that great? You remember what happened at Bethany? That's where he first sets up shop with Mary and Martha. Remember all the stuff that went on there? Come on, Martha. Slow down and listen to Jesus. 
Then what else happens there? Come, Jesus, come to Bethany soon. Lazarus is about to die. And Jesus tarries, and he gets there late, and he raises Lazarus from the grave. Lazarus, come out. And the man, the dead man rose, the Bible says. He goes to that place to remind them resurrection is in the future. Resurrection, this is the place. I've risen from the grave. I raised Lazarus from the grave. I will raise you from the grave. And lifting up his hands, he blessed them. Do you know you're blessed in the name of Jesus? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. You're blessed. You are blessed because of Jesus. You're not blessed because of some kind of ethereal nonsense. You're not blessed because God has many names. You're not blessed because you're such good people. You're not blessed because you're humanitarians. You're not blessed because you're environmentalists. You're not blessed because you sit and look at crystals. You're not blessed because you believe you're so smart that all religions are the same, and, uh, which is just a lazy excuse not to read the Bible. You're blessed in the name of Jesus, by Jesus. And he says, you are mine. Don't fear parents and grandparents. I know those kids wander, but Jesus promises Nothing shall tear them out of my hand. You keep praying. He blessed them, and he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. The first Old Testament text is all about joy. Joy, your sins are forgiven. Joy, you don't need to act like somebody else is never going to sin against you. Joy, you can forgive somebody if they sin. Joy, you can know even though you've sinned, you're forgiven. Joy, your future is sure in the midst of this morass of what's going on in the world today. Joy, rejoice. Joy everywhere. And finally, and they, diapantos, through it all, they were in the temple blessing God, saying thank you. Thank you through it all. Thank you. 150 years through it all. Thank you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.